A typical fighting man of the 14th to 16th centuries learned not just techniques for fencing with a particular sword, as was to become the case in later centuries, but acquired understanding of core close combat principles for general self-defense. Since he would have learned to grapple and wrestle, skillfully throwing his opponent or applying holes, this would have given him the necessary close-range skills applicable to all other melee weapons. Such training would often begin with the shortest and quickest of them, the ever-present dagger. From here, training would frequently move on to learning the staff, basis of all pole arms. If a fighting man had learned well the long sword employed with two hands, whether of the wider or the tapering variety of blade, he could then just as easily handle any similar weapon using nearly identical movements. If he had also studied the pole axe, this would have further taught him about all manner of axes and clubbing weapons, ideal for facing armors. Fighting with the tradition of sword and buckler, he learned not only the use of shields, but also the fluid and effective coordination of two weapons together, such as the sword and dagger combination. By the early 16th century then, a trained swordsman could easily pick up a slender, more tapered, single-hand sword and intuitively note instantly from its lighter, more agile handling that it would lend itself not to forceful thrust or large cleaving blows, but rather to versatile cut and thrust transitions aimed at more lightly armored targets. From this, it was no difficulty to deceptively apply even more rapid and longer-reaching thrusts from an even more slender blade designed specifically for piercing an unarmored adversary. But even this subtle way of fighting with finesse and cunning never completely eradicated the utility and the danger of the ferocious slashing edge from a good cutting blade. And it certainly never removed the all-important necessity in combat of using the free hand for close in actions. As opposed to the discipline required for more formal combats, wherein each party enters into it willingly and knowingly, preparation for war and general self-defense on the street was the primary motivator for a fighting man to seek prowess. Personal armed combat at this time was a violent, brutal, and bloody affair with little room for pretentious niceties and false etiquette. While social norms have always influenced ritual elements of close combat among different social classes, such as within formal duels, the chivalric literature of the time largely reflected an idealized manner of courteous combat that was contradicted by the harsh reality of survival in violent encounters. The Renaissance science of defense consisted of fighting skill in using diverse weaponry, such as single and two-handed swords, daggers, bucklers, and shields, assortments of staffs and pole weapons, battle axes, war hammers, and flails, as well as utilization of such fundamental elements as fighting in armor, grappling, body throws, joint manipulation, trapping holes, kicks, empty-handed strikes, disarming techniques, and the coordination of two weapons together in addition to fighting mounted or on foot and facing multiple opponents. All of this relied on understanding of systematic principles of self-defense. Masters of arms and authors on combat teachings or dueling codes during the Renaissance made it clear that a fighting man was customarily free to use whatever worked in war and individual combat. The historical record of battlefield fighting judicial combats, street fights, ambushes, sudden assaults, and private duels firmly establishes this. While noticeable episodes of compassion and honorable fair play, along with occasional restrictions for formality, are known in personal combat, so too are countless examples of deceit, ruthlessness, and thuggish behavior. The pragmatic reality lies somewhere in between. In classic Western tradition, Renaissance masters of defense attempted, through their works, 
to communicate their systems of self-defense and swordsmanship to future students. The volumes of this surviving technical literature now provides unmistakable proof that European fighting disciplines of the 14th to 17th centuries were highly developed and highly effective martial arts. While some of their works remain cryptic, others are detailed, systematic, and clear. They were written or compiled by men who had actually fought and killed and taught others their secrets. Yet today, most of these historical European martial art manuals are relatively unknown and still remain highly obscure, even among modern historians and fencers. The art of fencing itself has long existed now only as a Baroque-inspired sport of single duel with single sword, the rich traditions of Renaissance weaponry and methods of unarmed combat having long been abandoned and forgotten. Their martial teachings are only now being slowly recovered and reconstructed.